Okay, welcome back. Good afternoon. Week 10, we continue with our discussion of Louise Closer's in motor car divorce. This time, we're looking at a series of specific passages in the readings that you might want to use as a filter to understand how to read the required readings and also keep in mind as potential examples if you find a question in the final exam about this particular novel, about the themes, about the characters in the novel. And of course, during the month of November, I will also talk about the final exam. I will show you one or two sample questions, etc. On Thursday, the movie this week is Trafic, a French movie from 1971, directed by Jacques Tati, wonderful actor and director, only directed six feature-length films. In 1958, he received an Oscar for the best international film. That category had just been introduced in the second half of the 1950s. Traffic was originally uh, intended for TV and instead it was released in the theaters and it's a critical or paradoxical view of modern mobility, a visual representation of a world where people in the cars seem to be going nowhere because they're constantly stuck in traffic. And in fact, at the very end of the film, in the conclusion, the main character of Monsieur Hulot, played by Jacques Tati, and a secondary character, Maria, come out of the subway, it's raining, the, everywhere there are cars that are stuck or inching forward, and they simply walk through the cars. So the only people actually moving are people without cars. This week, I will also talk a little bit more about the final project on Thursday. Just keep in mind, if you missed one or both classes last week, that in the video recordings of last week, you will find segments, and they're all marked with video chapters, that you want to review with suggestions about the final project. In particular, keep in mind that by Thursday of last week, this page of the methodology of the final project was expanded with the inclusion of a template of a full-fledged example where the various sections for the treatment of a short story in the final exam, in the final project, are shown, demoed, with actual text, with actual notes. Initially, I had planned this assignment for this week. This is a traditional assignment for this class, but reflecting on this, it wasn't particularly successful last year, so I've decided to remove this assignment, which was supposed to be an encouragement to start thinking about the final project. So, I, it, it's not essential to me and it was not particularly useful to many of the students. Just keep in mind that if you need any help with the final project, starting with, for example, the submission of short stories you would like to include to get my feedback, simply reach out to me via email or schedule an appointment on Zoom during office hours. And keep in mind, as far as appointments are concerned, that I'm on campus every day, usually between 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. So if I'm not in a meeting, if I don't have an event at the Center for Italian Studies, that's where you will find me and uh, a simple email uh, will be sufficient if the office hours are not convenient for you. 
and we can schedule an appointment on a different day, okay? So, again, two things you can do between now and the time of the presentation and then the final project. One, just send a link my way saying, do you think this short story would be good for the project, would be relevant enough, interesting, easy to work with? And two, whenever you have an outline or notes about your project, put everything in your Google Docs file and leave a comment or shoot me an email saying, can you please review and let me know if I'm on the right track, okay? The presentation at the end of the semester is based on the final project. The ideal format would be for you to pick one story, maximum two, put some passages from these stories, put the Google Books or the Avi Trust pages of the story on the screen and discuss the story, right? In a simple format, right? Because the project itself will have a comprehensive treatment of the story. For the presentation, you can very much start from why you find the story interesting. What is that the story is trying to tell the readers about the representation of the automobile? What do you understand of this story from the language, from the episodes, from the actions or the words of the characters, from the arc of the story itself, okay? So it doesn't have to be formal, doesn't really have to be accompanied by a PowerPoint. It's up to you if you want, if you prefer, that's fine. Of course, the worst thing of all would be for you to put on a PowerPoint during the presentation, which is online on Zoom uh, with me and an individual student. The worst thing would be for you to put a PowerPoint and then to read everything from the slide, right? Because the from the learning point of view, the goal of the presentation is to show that you've learned enough to become an expert on a, short, on a short story that I might be familiar with or that I haven't read yet, and that you are able, you, you have mastered the language, you're able to clearly explain the significance of that story with reference to a few of the key team themes in the uh, class. Even in reference to the oral presentation, of course, we'll talk more in November. Now, before I proceed with the description and analysis of a series of select passages from a motor car divorce, I want to give you a chance to see the conclusion of the first auto, the film that we saw on Friday. So I'm going to recap the story in the film for anyone who missed Thursday, sorry, Thursday's class. Uh, keep in mind that there is a page. You see a fragment of it on the screen where you find a synopsis with some observations and remarks. Basically, the first auto, first of all, keep in mind it's 1927. By 1927, there were millions of people in the US, in US society, who owned and used a car. It was already changing the habits of people. Commercial distribution was heavily based on, heavily reliant on the use of small trucks or automobiles. So the film wants to capitalize on the success of this product by suggesting that they're going back with the title of the first auto, they're suggesting that they're going back to the roots of this phenomena and they're trying to surprise their viewers by implying, well, you find the automobile, all kinds of vehicles, very natural, an intrinsic part of your life, your daily lives. However, there was a time when automobiles were a novelty, when people could be opposed to the introduction of the automobile. And therefore, they put on the screen the story of two members of the same family, Hank Armstrong, the father, Bob, the son, who 
represent two different positions, the friends and the enemies of the automobile. The father very much attached to horses through his passion for horse racing. He's also a horse trader selling and buying horses. And his attachment to the past, his resistance to the innovations brought forth by the automobile threatens to ruin his relationship with his son because his pride blinds him to the point where he's verbally and almost physically abusive to his son simply because his son is more interested in automobiles than horses and the father's stubbornness and attachment to the past threatens the progress, the very growth of society, right? <laughs> the implication in this kind of film is that the family is an essential part of society and harmony within the family is crucial to the well-being of society. However, families do not live in isolation. They're part, they're, they're, uh, part of the engine of progress and therefore families should align themselves and some of their values with progress. Okay, this is the moralistic message of the film. In the film we see how Hank once celebrated as a horse racing jockey champion in his hometown of Maple City is then neglected, suffers from a lack of attention, lack of recognition from the people in town whose attention switches to the automobile. First, because there is an inventor who comes to town and gives a presentation with a, an interesting uh, mechanical projector. Then the first car ride becomes a show for an event for the whole town when the richest man, uh, a guy by the name of Stebbins, goes out with his family for what turns out to be a failing, a ruinous experience that will have the entire family plunge into a lake and emerge from the lake wet and frazzled. And the final betrayal is Hank seeing his son working in a mechanics shop right in front of the stables where he is buying and selling horses. And then the son moves away from Maple City, moves to Detroit, where he will be working with Henry Ford, with Barney Oldfields, with the pioneers of automobiling, writing once in a while, we see one letter to his father saying, I'll come back, I'll surprise you, you'll see what I've become. But really, not in touch with the development of the situation with his father, because his father has been forced to sell his business, sell his horses that have been put to auction to pay the debts, and is left with just the stables. He had to sell even... The, the, the horse bright eyes that reminded him of the female horse with which he, he would had won several races. At the end of the film, the son Bob is really coming to town for a race at the same racetrack where his father was victorious at the beginning of the film. However, his father, full of uh, rage uh, against the technology that has brought his life practically to an end, that has ruined his business, his reputation, his standing in society, his father has sabotaged his son's car following the suggestion of one of Rose's scorned lovers, Rose being the girlfriend of Bob, they added sulfur to the tank so that 
uh, through a chemical reaction, the automobile would then ex explode. Hank is, is hoping that once people see how dangerous automobiles are, they will go back to using horses that are much more reliable and less dangerous. And by the way, if you look at past society, especially during the 18th and 19th century when horses were more affordable and a lot of people used them uh, for transportation, there were plenty of accidents. People were being trampled by carriages. Carriages would break legs and arms. Um, people would have accidents of all kinds. So um, each means of transportation comes with different problems. And keep in mind for the conclusion, yet another demonstration that horses are inferior because once the father realizes that he has to go to the racetrack and stop the race, alert his son that his car could explode, the only thing he can rely on is Bright Eyes, the horse that has come back to him as his previous owner and somebody who loved that horse. And the horse is not fast enough. By the time he gets to the racetrack, uh, the, the accident is about to happen. So the initial passages for my presentation are taken from this, the notes on Louis Closer's Hale and Motor Car Divorce. But they're all passages from the readings, okay? So you, you'll find them there as well. This is from the beginning of the story. Remember how in the novel, Peggy, whose real name is Margaret, tells you John and I are going to get a divorce in an automobile and then she says the automobile will actually come first because it'll be the instrument for our divorce. Their plan is to ship the car to Naples, as they will do, travel from Naples to Paris, possibly to the west coast of France then and take a ship back to the US with their car. And during the trip, she's supposed to collect evidence of his abusive treatment of her so that they can present the evidence to a judge who will have to grant them the divorce, seeing that clearly uh, they're not made for each other. At the beginning, before they get on a ship to travel to Italy, John and Peggy uh, go on a car ride with a couple they know, the Haverleys. And this makes uh, Peggy doubt that they'll ever get a divorce. And what's interesting about this passage is that there is a couple, they argue with each other, and their arguments extend to the first part of their car ride because she's constantly hanking the horn because she wants people to come out of their houses and see them, notice that they're different, that they have a car, that they're special, they're important. And yet, in spite of every source of argument for this couple, by the time they get off the car, they're very much in love, right? And they're using the Dovi um, metaphors, they're billing and cooing, well, no, I, I didn't include that here, but you, you'll find it in the rest of the passage. Because the assumption is, what we should find interesting, is that the psychological effect of a car ride on a romantic couple <laughs> has to be positive. That the car facilitates romance. And of course, by 1906, there were plenty of examples of texts in the motor romance genre, we saw a very important one, the novel called The Lightning Conductor, but there were plenty of other examples from that period. So two things from this passage. One, the car has, the experience of the car has a psychological effect on the users. The car is not neutral as a technology. And second, this effect is bound to be positive rather than negative for most people with a specific 
power assigned to the car when it comes to love, producing love, feelings of love, making people fall in love, or reinforcing those same feelings in established couples. The next passage is from the initial part of the book where the characters have to pick a car, right? They're still in the process of looking at catalogs, going to dealerships, to actually to shops, right, to agencies, and they haven't decided yet. And Peggy explains that they, these are their simple plans. They can buy the cheapest car or buy the most expensive. When it comes to the most expensive, the decision is easy. They don't have enough money. They're wealthy enough for a car, but they don't have all that kind of money, that kind of money that would allow them to buy a Rolls Royce or a Cadillac, etc. But notice what they say about the cheapest car and why they don't want to be seen in a cheap car. And this goes to the argument, to the theme of the product, in this case the automobile, scaffolding the projection, the perception of your public persona. If you buy something and you're seen with this product, you want the product to enhance your public identity, not to bring it down. And this is part of the culture of consumerism during the 20th century in a big way, but that concept is still at work in our society. The cheapest, the cheapest car, has such ugly lines, the design of the car, I could never have gone about in it with any degree of comfort. Of course, She's talking about psychological comfort. Riding in a good-looking car is just like wearing good clothes. And again, don't assume that 200 years ago or 300 years ago, people reasoned about clothing in the same way. Up until the end of the 19th century, most people would possess, would own very few clothes, wear them for several years, of course, it doesn't mean that those were terrible. They were patched up. Uh, they were not... Uh, they were taken care of in different ways. Um, the consciousness of having on or being in something elegant, they're using clothes as a metaphor, gives one the courage to drive good bargains without losing one's self-respect. That is to say... Having a good product, being seen in a good product, whether it is what you wear or the car you're riding, gives you power in society, give you respect, gives you a way to manipulate others, right? You gain the respect of others and therefore you can negotiate when you're buying something or going around Europe without fearing to lose your face, your reputation. The next passage is from the time when Peggy is reflecting on Mrs. Baring, the widow that she thinks John is falling for. She's a rich woman herself. She's doing something similar. That is to say, she will be traveling through Italy and France with an automobile. She knows a lot about automobiles. And she's physically fit. Keep in mind that Peggy and Mrs. Barry are two different kinds of women. Peggy is slender, elegant, right, thin, following all the fashion trends in terms of what she wears and even the things she says. Whereas Mrs. Baring is a strong woman, strong physically, with a stronger will, a stronger personality compared to Peggy. And therefore she thinks that she would be not only the perfect fit for John, but she looks at Mrs. Baring as the perfect model for the modern woman. Because her physical aspect, her physical structure makes her 
apparently healthier, better at producing offsprings. And then on top of that, she's good with cars, and this makes her really the realization of everything that is modern about the future, right? She's tremendously interesting to John on account of her motoring, because she has something in common with him, her interest in car. Though she's very good looking too, but different from Peggy. She's large, which was supposed to be a good thing for the production of children. Finally built and very glistening. So polished, meaning she's very clean, right? It's very evident. Shiny hair, I mean, well scrubbed skin, white teeth that flash when she smiles. Smile itself, very positive. She's very confident, unlike Peggy. Not tigerishly, not aggressively, but in a friendly way and just as much at me as at John. She's comfortable in society, <laughs> not just with men. And this is what Peggy hears John say. John says he glows with pride when he sees an American woman, that's why we're talking about models of femininity, with the strength to start her own engine. As I suggested in the past, cranking the car to start the engine required both dexterity and strength. You really had to crank it in a decisive way, but then you need dexterity because you, as soon as you feel that the engine is picking, is revving, you have to remove your hand before the crank itself hits you in the back of your hand or your fingers, and people who, who were not good at it would break fingers. Just as if that mus muscular attribute was the crowning glory to a sanctified life. So. Apparently, she is the perfect woman for this kind of technological age. And also an age of progress, an age fixated with physical strength, health, hygiene, etc. Positivity, being positive, being confident in society in the right way. Next passage is the continuation of the passage with the couple who are arguing, but once they get on the car, they make peace and they come out of the car more in love than they were before. In this case, there is a label given to it, which is automobile elation, this positive feeling that overwhelms your mind, your psyche, when you're riding a car. So, in this case, they're going through Italy, they're driving from town to town, stopping to sleep at an inn, to eat at a restaurant, to see local monuments. John and I could still laugh wonderful. Still laugh is a reflection on the fact that they're there to divorce. So, she is almost surprised by the fact that even though this will be their last trip and they're separating, that they can still be in such a state of harmony and joy. Whenever we were in motion, right, the condition of being <laughs> at speed, we would become deliriously happy. Where deliriously gives you this idea of reason being cast aside because they're overwhelmed by this joy. Immediately forget past difficulties, the car is absorbing, the car ride is a complete immersion, is the only reaction to it, and the possibility of future ones, and just love everybody. John says this is called automobile elation. All motorists have the sensation. It is hurled unto them, along with a swift current of air. <coughs> Remember that the idea was that breathing on the car while the car is speeding is considered a form of exercise. It's a funny thing. Keeps me snappy in the daytime and heavy with sleep at night. So it's good for her. It's soothing. It's relaxing. And removes any barrier to the enjoyment of life and the enjoyment of 
her relationship. And of course, at the end, she goes back to the suggestion of this adverb still by saying, some moments I quite forgot that this trip was not for pleasure. This trip is to gather material to bring to a judge and be granted a divorce. This is another funny bit that in central Italy, central and southern Italy was famous for street thieves in the past called brigands. And their trip through Italy is very picturesque and stereotypical, so they have to meet with one of these guys. The funny thing about the episode is that they find this armed thief blocking the road while they're having trouble with the car, and they immediately uh, gesture that they want to surrender, and in fact, they suggest that they're willing to give the guy the car. They don't want the car anymore. And, and of course, they want to survive this encounter, but at the same time, it's kind of, let's get rid of this unstable, unreliable technology. The funny thing is the reaction of the thief who says, no, 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 I don't want your car. Your car cannot be used as a getaway car for a holdup because it doesn't work. It's not reliable enough. And if I bring it to the cave, of course, brigands live in caves, my wife will complain that the thing is smelly. She will not want the car. So not even a street thief wants to have a car. Later on, since the car is not working, they find refuge in a farm. From there, they will go and fetch someone to repair the car, to get spare parts, to replace some things that were not working in the car. Meanwhile, Peggy is invited inside the house. There is a young woman there. And clearly, the young woman sees her as a rich foreign woman who's dressed very well with elegant clothing. And this is the representation of the idea we found earlier that whatever product you show with you or on you represents who you are. To the point where you're not seen for who you are at all. You're seen just as the owner of these accessories or products. So the young woman doesn't speak English and Peggy doesn't speak much Italian, so they cannot have a conversation. But their whole interaction is about what Peggy is wearing. And the young farmer, the young Italian farmer is touching the clothing, is looking at the jewelry, is admiring Peggy for the products she's wearing. So the message is all in the first line. No queen could have been more gently handled. She's, she's treated like queen by virtue of the things she is wearing, by virtue of the products she purchased and put on during this trip. So it's very much about the logic of consumerism. You are the things you buy and the things you show in public. And Peggy is seen by Louise, the narrator, as a very superficial woman. Peggy is fine with this treatment. She fails to see that the, far, the young woman, the farm woman, doesn't see Peggy as a person at all. She's only seen shops and products, right? She's not trying to connect in any real authentic way. But this is fine for Peggy because Peggy herself is a champion of consumerism and she feels important. She doesn't need to show any personal trait as long as she's treating She's treated like that. And, and of course, the car frames this encounter in a different way. They're like fairies in a broken down motor car, right? The fact that they're traveling with a motor car makes them, in a way, superior to these people living in this Italian farm. The next passage is one of a few where the two characters the husband and wife, John and Peggy, are talking to the car. And one of several that you find in the literature from this time and later times, the idea that 
within the combination, the symbiotic interaction between the car and the user, the car gets humanized, the user gets machinized, loses its empathy, takes the car to be an armor or a shell and therefore easy to fall into road rage episodes. But in this case, the car, once again, doesn't collaborate. They're trying to get to their destination and the car has problems that manifest themselves with noises, right? Pantings and gurglings, but in their mind, it's like the car is talking to them. Twice, I'm sure it said, what's your hurry? And once John caught it muttering something about, treat me right and I'll treat you right, those are the words attributed to the car. Tell us what you want, said John persuasively. Do you want more gasoline? No answer. Don't you like the nice new oil in the cylinders? Not a sound. John himself was sure it was a leaky valve, etc. But the important part is this interaction where the car becomes more human and the users less so. And in terms of the reactions provoked by the passage of a car, especially in the Italian countryside where few cars in 1905, when the actual trip was made by the author, were traveling the roads, it's clear in this representation that the car becomes a magic object, almost a religious object that becomes the target of the people's respect and reverence. And you have here different people coming towards the car, drawn by the passage of the car. The first part is interesting. It's about trains. A train typifies only the means to an end, meaning trains are only about transportation, nothing more. They cannot stir any emotion. By this time, people have adapted to the passage of trains and therefore trains mean very little to them. In a motor, in a car, while we are great people to the peasants, we are among them. So we can interact with the people around us. And of course, interaction means simply that they're the center of attention. The men and women of the fields run pell-mell, so chaotically, to the hedge at the sound of our horn and wave a greeting. The little boys, notice the catalog, the men, the little boys, the old women, etc. The little boys of the village meet us in one gate, think of a typical small town or village in Italy surrounded by walls with gates to enter and exit the village. The little boys of the village meet us in one gate and patter after us as we pass through the other. Of course, the car would proceed slowly through the narrow lanes of a village in Italy. That's still the case. Old women nod from their looms. The women are working outside with cotton and they nod, acknowledging the importance of the car. An old man rings in their ears and hats in hand. Of course, there is a very ethnic representation of Italian men in rural areas, uh, but there is no indication that most men during that period would wear rings in their ears, but they're represented in the most ethnic possible, most ethnic way possible. Ask with the simplicity of their race, right, they're different, the price of such belly automobili. I wonder how we can give them enough to admire in our poor selves and equipment as a fair exchange for what they give us. Once again, she's wondering, are they admiring us or the car? They're actually admiring the car. They don't see them for the person's they are. And sometimes that's fine. In this case, it provokes some perplexity. And yeah, I think I have enough time for the conclusion of the, um, of, of the novel. First, chapter 16 is when the couple reaches Turin. Remember how their trip from Naples to northern Italy is a trip 
in customs, models of civilization. Naples is the most ancestral land where people live driven by primitive passions, jealousy, a strict kind of morality, etc. Religion, of course. And Turin is the industrialized future and therefore for automobiles. <coughs> and in a way, this part of the novel is like an anthropological report. What happens in a city where you find so many cars such as Turin? Well, you find the Rimesa, you find garages where all these cars are parked and worked on, right? And they're compared to great beasts massing themselves together under one doomed roof. It's really the point of view of an explorer who has come to a wild, new kind of place. And this is John describing what a garage for automobiles looked like. Don't forget that even in the US in 1906, most people would park their cars in what used to be stables. And only in big cities such as New York City you would find modern garages. And uh, John explains how he had to pay, he had to give tip uh, in, in gold and silver coins to the guys in the garage to get admitted, to get to park his car because there are so many of those cars occupying the garage. And in fact, in the end, he was able to park the car not because of the bribe, rather because the mechanic saw that he was driving an American car and they're curious about it. They want to have it in the garage to observe the American technology because cars are being made in Turin and Europe and, different, and they're different from the American cars. And this is when we see how Peggy, who has been working on, on her practical and theoretical competence about the car, knowledge and competence, Peggy is finally transforming into a modern woman. And this is where it becomes evident. She says, I had intended to go do the town, right? Turin was a big city, uh, European city full of shops, etc. However, Peggy decides not to do. This is what the old Peggy would have done. But I think I'll go to the garage instead. And she's going by herself to the garage. John sat still, shaking inwardly. Now, John, what are you laughing at? The motor beam, it's in your eye, right? You can see the passion she has found now for the car in her eyes. And she goes there, she describes the garage, how the cars are grouped by brand so that the experts in those brands can work. In fact, if you go to the Museo dell'Automobile in Turin, the very first room, well, the first room has plenty of models and a carriage, etc., but um, the very first room with cars is the imitation of a garage from the early 1900s, and you can find pictures of that on the web. And everyone is working, right? Everyone is interested in cars, and for a space of a few hours, Peggy becomes one of them. This is the very final episode. Then there is an epilogue in the novel. But as I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, at the end of the story, while they're arguing because Peggy is convinced that John is in love with another woman, he's trying to convince her that it is not so. They've stepped out of the car. They're somewhere south of Paris in the countryside, and there are rocks. And John, trying to help Peggy, Peggy seems to be falling off those rocks. He falls back himself, hits his head, loses consciousness, clearly he has a head trauma, 
and she has to act. She has to act by herself. She has to show her independence, make decisions. She cannot rely on John any longer, as she used to do in the first part of the novel. And it's imperative that she show how to drive the car, that she can drive the car, in order to get to a hospital and bring back a doctor. She decides to leave John there because she knows enough medicine that it's dangerous to move someone who has had a head trauma. So leaves him safely on the ground and drives the car as quickly as possible. And this is initially the internal dialogue in Peggy's mind about her emotions. She's afraid John will die. She's afraid that even if John survives, he will leave her to go and be with another woman, the famous Mrs. Baring. And at the same time, she's trying to focus on the car, trying to remember how to operate the car correctly. I knew then that there was just one thing I waited, and that was for John to live. No matter what the relationship will be in the future, she wants to save him. And she's waiting for the answer. What is the solution? I held my breath and listened. He's unconscious. He cannot tell her what to do. There was no voice, no sound of life, only the sullen pounding of the engine of our motor car. They left the car with the engine on. The sullen pounding of the engine, it came like an answer to my cry for help. But how could I, right? Is she powerful enough to go through this experience? John had always been there with me when I had driven it, so now she has to show her independence and pass this test. And she takes the car. You find her dealing with the technical issues, I'll go into the high speed. A lot of the cars only had three gears. Low speed, high speed, and reverse. I'll go into to the high speed. It doesn't set in. Oh dear, what is the matter? Hold on now, Peggy. Don't get panicky. She helps herself. There, it's going faster. But what does it need to give it power? Why, fuel, of course. In older cars, you had to pump the fuel manually which is why having another person on board, especially during races, was essential, right? So she has to open the throttle uh, and, and deal with the road because the roads are not made for cars, right? They have rats from the carriages that create this thin ditches on the road that are dangerous for drivers. Um, okay, so she knows that her motivation is strong, that she wants to say, save him. But little by little, there is an interesting transformation that makes the conclusion brilliant. That is to say, not only does she demonstrate her power and independence, but she finds this whole experience empowering because she has to come to terms with the emotions produced by their car ride which are positive let me circulate the attendance I forgot the last time these emotions are positive and they're her own personal emotions not sanctioned by society because in this kind of situation, society would dictate that as a wife who's about to lose her husband, she must be stricken by sadness and grief. And this is not what she's experiencing. She's experiencing elation, exhilaration, a feeling of true empowerment that she will have to keep for herself even after the conclusion. Of course, she's kind of a hero because she's trying to save her husband who's dying. Yet, 
there is something else that goes on with her, her own personal emotions and reactions, her place in this story, regardless of her role as a wife. Um, so it's the feeling of speed, right? In, in between she's saying, oh, he's dying, oh my God, I'm losing my husband. We're whizzing, right? If John were here to see me, Margaret Ward, her full name, right? Who she is. You're exulting. You feel elated. Remember the previous passage. Are you a fiend? Are you a bad person? Or are you like the rest of poor humanity? What things thoughts are. I'm glad that no one knows them but in yourselves. She's found her own core, right? A core where she can decide what to share with others, right? That others don't need to know everything about herself and control her through this. How long ago that was when I reasoned that aloud? We were, uh, okay. And coming close to the end, she has to go down and then up a hill. So she has to gain speed. How the air cuts my face. There are policemen, French policemen, telling her that she's going too fast, trying to stop her. But she cannot do. And yet at the same time, I'm laughing, right? She has this strong positive reaction of all the times to laugh. So for the first time, she realizes that she's her own person and that she needs to put boundaries, even in a marriage. This positive reaction, which seems to be paradoxical because John was dying, is something she will have to keep to herself. And that's the solid foundation of her new life. Uh, there, I laughed again. How horrible society dictates that reaction. They don't seem to understand I'm making this quick run for John. Do they suppose I'm doing this because I like it? Yes. She likes it. Well, don't I like it, don't I? Now the truth, but it's her truth. Okay? And at the end, I can't help feeling sort of drunk, but it isn't happiness, it's power, it's... And she doesn't finish the sentence. It's up to you to imagine. It's freedom. It's love for life, love for herself, right? And, and there she becomes more of a modern woman. When finally John wakes up at the hospital, it seems like she says, you love me now because I can run a car. She has turned into the ideal woman in some way, but the essential part is that um, she's now in a position to be herself because there are clear boundaries between her life and the life of others. Here John himself says, I was so taken by the car that I ignored you, that I didn't pay attention to you, not that I wanted a divorce. It's just that the experience of the car uh, forced me to neglect you. And the conclusion, do you know, John, I answered him mindful of my own joy, why joy, but this is what she's not telling him, even while I fear that John was dying. I think I can, right? Now she is more empowered.